We can measure hundreds of chemicals in the eggs and in the alligators. These are largely man-made chemicals. These are chemicals that probably shouldn't be in the alligators and they shouldn't be in us. This is Justin with We Are Change Orlando and this past weekend I had the chance to attend the 33rd annual Beyond Pesticide Conference in Orlando, Florida. I got the chance to hear from some amazing speakers including scientists, researchers, farm workers, all educating us on toxic pesticides and their effect on our health, animals, and the environment. We also got a toxic tour of Lake Apopka where we heard from farm workers that were forced to work on the lake in toxic conditions without being told and without getting the proper protection and then developing cancer and dying and, and even spreading it to their family and future generations. And it went from that to scientists finding mutant hermaphrodite alligators inside the lake. And basically this uh, chemical cocktail of pesticides was being increased after agricultural practices in the 50s and 60s. And this resulted in making it one of the most toxic lakes in the nation by 1998. And this once beautiful Central Florida lake, known for fishing, is now known for killing the farm workers that work on it and turning the alligators from male to female that are inside the lake. So I got the chance to sit down with Dr. Lou Gillette. Um, he's a scientist who in the late 80s uh, was working on the reproductive biology of alligators in Florida lakes and he noticed some very strange things in Lake Apopka and this is what he found. Well, the first thing that became really obvious was that the hatching rates, that is, if you actually got 40 or 50 eggs from the nest, um, for most lakes, we were already concerned, we were only getting about 50% hatch rates. Lake Apopka was actually getting us 10 or 15 or 20% hatch rates. Wow. So that meant that 80% of the eggs were dying before an embryo or an unit ever hatched. Um, and so that's, a, that's an instant giveaway. I mean, the, we had predicted that um, the best lakes should be hatching 90% or greater of their eggs. And we actually had some support for that, and I had actually done work in Africa um, in very pristine areas with, with Nile crocodiles in the Okavango Delta of Botswana, which we were getting 90-95% hatch rates. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of expected. So having 50%, that was bad, but then to actually have lakes even doing worse, like like Apopka, that was, that was, that was an issue for concern. Yeah, that sounds like a red flag. Um, what, uh, what was the first, what was your first assumption? Um, what did you think was causing this at first? Our first assumption, well, I think our first assumption was that, that the animals were, had, their diet had changed. Mm -hmm. Maybe because the lakes had changed, they had become uh, more eutrophic, as we said, there were more nutrients and so on. We then thought, well, maybe the vegetation had changed around the lakes. And so, remember, these alligators lay their eggs in a nest. That nest rots, that material rots. And so it could be that the gas environment, that is how much oxygen versus CO2 had changed. Or, and so we, we tried all kinds of things. We also started to think, well, maybe Lake Apopka is unique because it's at the headwaters of part of the Okawaha. So maybe the genetics were different because maybe the population had decreased to the point that you had genetic inbreeding. Mm -hmm. We tested all those hypotheses and that would work. Finally, we started to say, well, maybe, maybe it's something in what they ate. Mm -hmm. And about that time, we started to have real issues because besides that, we started to see other things when we actually looked at the baby alligator. So we were looking at taking biopsies like a physician or a vet would. And we started to see that there were ovaries in the testes were happening. We started to notice that the hormone levels, estrogens, testosterone, those values were different than they were in other lakes, which were getting us better at Yeah, that really stuck out to me in, in your talk. I mean, you go down there to look at these alligators and they're practically mutant. I mean, what's going on? It's like something out of a movie like there was a nuclear spill or something. Well, it's, it's interesting that, you know, when you look at them, it's almost an extreme. Mm -hmm. The interesting part, however, is that, and, and this is, I think, the hard part, is that we, we want to see birth defects in the sense of missing limbs. And missing, I mean, we don't want to see it, but we expect that if something is wrong, what you see is they don't got the right number of eyes. Right. They don't got the right number something of arms black and legs. White. Something yeah. really black and white, which then freaks us out. Right. It's we call it again the dead baby in the street syndrome, or or the sick baby. It's really obvious. It freaks you out. These baby alligators were hatching out, and most of them looked okay. 
I mean, some of them were, they, they looked a little sickly, they, you know, they, they, they were weak. But you thought, oh, no, they look okay. And it wasn't until we started to go in and ask the more sophisticated, sophisticated questions, like you would actually do, let's say, with a baby that comes into a clinic and doesn't look just right. I mean, it looks like a baby. It has the right number of arms and legs and eyes and everything else. It's, it's a baby. It's healthy. But maybe it's not as healthy as we think. Where did you, um, when did you come to your conclusion of what was the causing this? I mean, what, what's making these alligators do this? What's poisoning this lake like this? This is actually a great question because I have to say to you, I think the data supports the idea that it's a mixture of chemicals that are in the environment in a pop that probably are the response largely of agricultural activities in the area but also probably runoff from stormwater, sewage, etc. We can measure hundreds of chemicals in the eggs and in the alligators from Lake Apopka. We can also measure, quite honestly, hundreds in, in uh, the alligators from other lakes. These are largely man-made chemicals. These are chemicals that probably shouldn't be in the alligators and they shouldn't be in us. That's, our, that's, that's what we're still working on. Can I say definitively no. And I can't say definitively it's this chemical A or that chemical B. But what we have been able to do in the laboratory is start to replicate some of the things we're actually seeing in the field by exposing animals to mixtures of chemicals that we actually see at Lake Park. Now, can we get every symptom? No. And that's why it becomes really interesting of what part of this may be due to chemicals. What part of it may be due to differences in nutrition? Um, we don't know, and that's why the work continues. But is Lake Apopka, for example, is it clean? Is it safe? Mm -hmm. The answer for me is no. The, the baby alligators are telling me that that environment is still not a safe environment, at least for baby alligators. Now, does that tell us something about humans? I think it does. I think if the environment's not healthy for their kids, then it's probably not healthy for our kids. But we need to do some more work. I noticed some of the uh, information that was coming out, you know, with some of the red flags at the lake and some of your work. What was the response from the city and the state and the regulatory agencies? I mean, was this, um, you know, were they shocked to hear this? Were they ready to clean it up? Actually, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody from any of the cities um, around Lake Apopka. I briefly talked to, talked to several of the folks in the Florida DEP. I've never talked to anybody in the capital. Um, this work, however, was extensively used um, by the federal government. And you know, we talked to the EPA, we talked to the CDC. In fact, our work was in part used by Congress to pass the Food Quality Protection Act, protecting kids with pesticides. That was in 1997. So it has been used. Um, it's been used extensively. Um, the data that we've collected, the kinds of work we do in Europe for most of the pesticide laws there, as well as in Japan. And I've testified in Congress um, in the United States. That was in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. But I testify on a regular basis overseas in Europe um, and in Japan to various ministries about this. It's, uh, it's been interesting that this work has actually yeah. made a much bigger impact outside of the state of Florida than it has necessarily within the state of Florida. Although I do know that people within the state of Florida are aware of it. That's good, yes. And I mean, I've lived here my whole life, and I've, I'm noticing more and more people become aware of it. I've actually seen things online now speaking about the toxicity of the lake. It's great to see the awareness. You know, we see what's happening to the alligators, the farm workers on it. You know, anyone close to it is being affected by this. Are you optimistic about the, uh, the future of Lake Apopka? I am optimistic. Um, clearly, um, folks I think are serious about trying to, to change the direction that that lake is going in. So we actually have not just government agencies, but we also have lots of citizen-based agencies, um, non-governmental organizations that care deeply about the environment. Not just Lake Apopka, but the environment in Florida. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. I think the biggest issue um, is continued education. I think people have to, have to be aware that the health of the environment that they're fighting for is not just a healthy kid or a healthy grandchild, 
but it's also healthy wildlife. And again, if the environment's not healthy for our kids, it's not going to be healthy for their kids. If it's not healthy for their kids, that is the wildlife, it's not healthy for our kids. We are, in fact, intimately linked to the environment. And I think we're becoming more and more aware of that. And so my hope is that we are changing. Yes, there are vested interests out there. And yes, there are times when we think the government not only doesn't listen to us, but goes out of their way not to listen to us, just to listen to what we call big money. But the take home is, is that we have a country where citizens make a difference. And I believe that we will continue to make a difference.